Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer at CBS Sports, joined today as always by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's episode, we have a special guest interview today ahead of leg two of the UWCL quarterfinals. A quick reminder that you can follow us on Twitter for all news and updates at Attacking Third. You can watch us at video too at youtube.com slash attacking third. Be sure to hit subscribe so that you never miss our exclusive interviews or whenever we go live. Our special guest for today is a striker for Lyon in Division One Feminine, Norwegian International, and 2018 Ballon d'Or winner, Ada Hedgerberg. Welcome to the show, Ada. Hey, guys. Nice to be on a 100% football-orientated podcast. I love it. Women's football. Yes, I love it. I love it, Ada. Keep that energy. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. We were chatting a little bit off mic and we're all so enthusiastic to spend this time together. You as an athlete, us as hosts of the of a women's soccer podcast. Uh, and you're joining us ahead of leg two of a UWCL quarterfinal. The match will be taking place on Wednesday, March 30th. And Leon is behind on aggregate. I'm going to hit you with the tough questions first. How have preparations been for you and the team ahead of the match? How, how, how's the training and everything been going? Well, you know, like we put ourselves in, in that situation. So now it's all about us uh, fixing it. And I think um, there's no time to lose. Um, going into that game with uh, good spirits, positivity, um, being realistic about the situation as well. Like it's very easy. You got to win the game with two goals. And I think it's important to be uh, orientated about the situation. So um we just gotta go there know that we have the quality uh, and go into there with good spirits and just do the job in front of hopefully a good crowd in Lyon it's nice to have the perspective and, and really know what you need to do and looking at the history of the club of Lyon nine finals appearances seven titles five consecutive titles knowing the successful history of this club what pressures do you feel heading into this quarterfinal stage, especially being behind on aggregate? I feel like that has been kind of our success, though, like loving those games. Uh, you kind of prepare the whole year uh, for these periods. Uh, it's like Christmas for us, you know. Uh, and I think that um, it also like uh, when you get tougher times with some results, it also shows that them, we actually managed to cruise on a five year in a row winning the Champions League, which is quite nuts when you think about it. But when you're just in the role, uh, you just want to continue. And that's football as well, you know. Uh, it's all about who won the last trophy. Uh, it's been quite uh, rough to be uh, sitting watching other teams lifting it or what, uh, sitting other, we're watching other team lifting it yet last year. So I know we got a great challenge there in front of us, but uh, we got to go into it with high spirits and believe in ourselves. Uh, it's not going to be an easy one, but we need to get back there to, to be top, uh, top dogs again. Let's maybe talk a little bit about the transition from leg one to leg two. Uh, you, you touched on the preparations a little bit. We're talking a little bit about team history a little bit. But in the present, maybe there's going to have to be some team adjustments a little bit, right? Uh, the, the match, uh, seeing somebody like Ali Carpenter getting a red. What what have been some of the team discussions and how has uh, team morale been, uh, you know, ahead of this uh, big match coming up? Well, I think you got to regroup, um, stick together and figure out the, how you want to attack the next game, the next leg. Uh, if you look at the first game, obviously, in my eyes, you need to go away from that game, uh, almost winning it. Um, that wasn't the case, um, but now we got 90 minutes to, to clear this all. It's, it's all about having cool heads, you know, uh, work with concentration, be focused. Uh, we know we have the quality, but it's all about sticking together um, and be prepared uh, tactically um, and just show up at the pitch on Thursday. And I'm sure if we do that, we'll create the opportunities in order to qualify. Looking at personnel and player and Ada, you knowing our podcast, we cover the NWSL and, and the women's team. And we love to look at the UWCL and the crossover is even better for us. There are a few new additions with Leon. Kat Macario has been with the squad since 2021. And then Lindsay Haran, two United States women's national team players. What have 
Lindsey Horan and, and Kat Macario added to the team? What, what differences do they bring into the squad? Well, I would say um, getting Katharina in last uh, winter uh, was uh, a great thing for us. I think that uh, this season you should really show, uh, she really shows her qualities within the team. Uh, she's here for long term, uh, really committed to mark her, um, yeah, mark her territory on Lyon, which is great. Uh, very positive character, uh, hardworking, which I appreciate a lot. And I'm very excited to have her here because I really think that she can bring something um, in doing the way she, she plays to the style we're playing. Um, obviously, Lindsay has been here. Uh, I know her a little from before on. A great girl. Uh, she has won in her career before. Uh, she already was in, in France, so she kind of had a little bit of that experience as well. And now it's all about um, getting her fit and ready to, to go uh, go at the pitch, um, but obviously two very nice girls to have in a group, but also uh, very decent footballers. For, forgive us. The Americans had to ask you about the two. Amer I get the American <laughs> vibe. Don't you worry. I'll give you the good questions. I'll give you the good vibes to all Americans out there. They're doing good, guys. They're doing I'm good. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure the listeners in our audience appreciate that. But you know what? I think it's it's time to jump into uh, the Norwegian side of things uh, and, and ask you, about how it was recently announced that you have you know, made your return to the Norwegian national team after a five-year absence. Uh, could you chat with us and, and our listeners a little bit about uh, the process, what that process was like in, in making your return to the national stage? Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I, I felt it was time. I, um, this, not, this is not a decision that made, uh, was made during night, you could say. There's been a process behind it, uh, obviously I, was uh, far away from the pitch for a while, got the time to step aside and uh, reflect on things. Uh, but obviously there's been a process, especially with Lisa Klavnes, which is the president of the Federation at, at the moment. Um, and she kind of like, felt like she reached out uh, a little hand in order to kind of like discuss the whole situation. Uh, I felt like I was talking more to a ex-colleague uh, because we played together uh, I was very young but she was and she was on, on the very end of her career and obviously Lisa was not a part of the federation back in 2017 so I kind of felt like I had a space where I could very talk talk very freely about the whole situation and I mean I just really want to get back there and connect uh, with the next generation, young girls, young boys. I want to be back with the team to represent your, my country. And I just miss that, you know? So um, there's been a process, but I, I felt that now, now was the time. You mentioned having some time away from the pitch and part of that due to injury that you suffered starting in January, 2020, followed by September of 2020 and, and your tibia fracture. It was almost 20 months away from the pitch due to injury. How was, how was your mindset during that time off of the pitch? What were you thinking about mentally? Terrible. I'm kidding. <laughs> No, but you can't imagine like being a journalist and not be able to write or talk. I mean, that's basically the situation of an athlete. It's um, it's an athlete's biggest um, nightmare, you could say. And but I, you know what? I just tried to turn the situation around and and try to figure out how can I turn this into something positive. And I I genuinely think that I got away from it being uh, stronger both physically and mentally. I learned things about my body uh, that I didn't even know before um, mentally. I felt like I went into a, something really unknown uh, and kind of like got out on the uh, other side, um, feeling like a different person almost and a different player. And I look at it in a very positive manner. And so, you know, uh, I wish I didn't end up in that situation, but now I just embrace it and I use it as my strength. It's a part of me. It's such a good mindset to have because of that. Now that you are back on the pitch, how is it going? How is getting back into form after being away from it for so long? 
Oh, I'm enjoying. I I um, keep repeating myself, but I feel like a little girl again. I just go to training and try to enjoy every minute. I know that I'm only 26, uh, that I still have many years to accomplish more badass things that I want to accomplish on the pitch. So I'm just going to training and I'm just very happy to be able to do what uh, I love the most and uh, playing football it's it's my biggest passion and and being back uh getting up the pace is something that i enjoy you know it, uh, you touched on it very briefly but having so much time away from the pitch yes rehab is important rehabilitation is important getting back to fitness is important but you know sometimes something else happens you get perspective right being away from the pitch for so long so for someone like you ha who has you know, been on top of the game, uh, you know, at, at one point and now making your return, you, I'm sure you've got a number of perspectives, you know, having to witness so much happening across the women's game globally. What is your perspective of the women's game right now as you're making your return, getting your runs back out on the pitch? Oh, I think we could have discussed that topic for uh, during the whole night over here. Oh, I know. But, uh, that's for another time, ladies, for another time. Um, but obviously, seeing the game, um, having the time to take a step back and actually observing what, what's happening uh, everywhere. Um, COVID hit us. I think that COVID hit us bad. Uh, I think that in, in the discussions, women's football were kind of forgotten. Uh, we lost our momentum, I feel, um, both in having fans in the stadiums, building the professionality by the game. So I think that that's been a challenge for us. Uh, you can see that we're slowly picking up again. Um, the whole hot subject, keeping uh, the moment of, momentum of women's football alive. Um, I think we're, we're slowly building up again, um, but it's all about raising our voices, uh, footballers, uh, do the job on the pitch, but also raise our voices in order for the women's football to continue its development because there's still a long road to go uh, and we haven't gone there yet. Yeah, you know what, Ada, you're right. We probably should have talked to you even more about this, but you know what? That means that we'll have to have you back on the show. Exactly. A little bit more about this, but we want to thank you so much for joining us today on Attacking Third. We also like to thank our listeners for listening along with us. Everybody, you can follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third for more. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. We're also available as video. Subscribe at youtube.com slash Attacking Third, and we'll be back this week with so much more. For Sandra Herrera, Lisa Roman, and Ada Hedgerberg, this was Attacking Third.